Sometimes when I pick a game to review, it's something that's been on my radar for a while, it's something that I've been really wanting to play. Take for example my recent Tomb Raider review or Theme Hospital a few months back. Other times, however, it's simply a case of me plucking a random game off the shelf for a console I haven't covered in a while, usually with no context as to what it's actually about, and then seeing what happens. Sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised. A lot of times though I find myself asking the question, what have I got myself into? Thoughtifence, developed by Craft Gold and published by Sega in 1993, fits squarely into the latter category. I have no idea when or where I even bought this cartridge, it's just kind of always been there. The Otterfins are characters by a German comedian named Otto Walks. Haven't heard of it? Well, neither had I. But wait, did I just say Craft Gold? The C64 Gods? Yes, the creators of Euridian made a platform game about obscure German cartoon characters in the early 1990s. It's a good start, but can it deliver? Hildefints are elephant-like creatures, and the star of this romp is the baby elephant Bruno. For some reason or another, young Bruno is convinced his father has been kidnapped by aliens. This ultimately appears to be false because he is a dumb child, as his dad is just working late at the office. Maybe Bruno should be blaming a demanding management team rather than ETs. Regardless, he follows a trail of lollies that fell from his dad's briefcase through an assortment of environments like his bedroom, the back garden, and his dad's workplace. Throughout his journey, he'll encounter plenty of foes which seem terrifying through his young simple eyes, although, in reality, they consist of bland everyday things like bugs and toys. Otterfence is a very run-of-the-mill platformer that is to be expected on 4th gen hardware from the early 1990s. There are plenty of platforms, as the genre would suggest, with the main goal being to collect a selection of these drop suites before you can exit the level. I'm not entirely sure what the required percentage is, however, since it let me continue, having collected very little, on a few occasions. The lowest was 25%, which was a later level by the way, which begs the question, what's even the point? Why would I continue to explore the level to collect a bunch of meaningless colourful crap if it will just let me continue? continue anyway. What's the incentive? I couldn't really give an elephant's trunk about a high score. It's not like the environments are particularly interesting to explore either. The platforming is also quite a bland and frustrating experience for the most part. It's either an endless stream of platforms close together with minimal defence, which is of course very easy, or it will consist of jumps that if easily missed will send you to your doom for a cheap death. These are usually mixed in with powerful enemies that will randomly and unnaturally spike the difficulty by attacking from off screen too. Games that lure you to your doom or include invisible threats to extend the game time are cheap tricks and they really rustle my gym gyms. The controls aren't too bad at least. While a bit slippery, little Bruno is very dexterous and responsive to quick platforming. Craft Gold got that right, and the talents shine through for a slight moment, but the levels needed more work. There are hints of what could have been. The levels are nicely layered. While banal in operation, there is a good feeling of progression even though it ultimately feels pointless. There are jumpy bits, moving bits, slidey bits, all the staples you'd expect from a typical 90s platformer. But it just doesn't come together. Sometimes you are required to find switches to open certain parts of the level, but this is about as creative as the level design gets, which isn't saying much. Another trait of Bruno is his ability to suck platforms towards him using his trunk. This is instantly more of an attractive gameplay element than finding switches, but it's not used nearly enough. It sucks too, <laughs> literally, because this is the foundation of what could have been a great mechanic, but instead it's used in a sparingly and dull manner. The enemies can be taken care of by either bouncing on their heads Mario style, or by shooting coloured pellets from Bruno's trunk. I'm not sure how many he has stored away in there, but there's a seemingly unlimited supply. There's also a smattering of power-ups that can be earned by collecting three of the same coloured paddle pop. Well, I'm not sure if they're paddle pops, that might just be an Australian thing. But regardless, icy sweets. These are rare though, and don't really assist a whole lot. They sometimes even hinder the experience, like the speed boost, which usually results in speeding off a platform onto a spike. 
Bruno is nimble as it is. A lot of enemies are very easy to deal with though, while some will take you by surprise off screen as before mentioned, if you learn to keep your distance and be a little patient, not much skill is required to knock them off from afar. There are boss fights at the end of each segment too, but I found these particularly unimaginative. I'm a big fan of boss fights in general because I love the process of figuring out how to take down a foe while under the pump. There's always a catch for a seemingly undefeatable adversary and solving that puzzle is a real thrill. In the Otterfants, there is none of that. Nope. You just take them on like any other enemy from a distance while expelling an endless supply of pellets. You do it for a bit longer, sure, and move quicker, but they're lackluster encounters overall. There is a bit of redemption when it comes to the graphics and sound at least. Most levels are nicely varied in appearance and include visually appealing parallax scrolling. While the garden level is a bit garish, my eyeballs certainly didn't burn away too much while playing. It's just my brain that did that as it slowly withered away with boredom. And again, the sound is fine. It's repetitive. It sounds like generic Mega Drive platformer music, but that's okay. My ears didn't burn much either. All this begs the question, what's the hook? Where is it? I didn't find it. Was it buried deeper in the levels I didn't bother to explore once I found the exit? The fact is, the other fence is average. I spent most of this review ragging it, for sure, but I've played worse. But this could have been so much better. Its A to B nature makes it about as exciting as commuting to work. I guess if I had an attachment to the characters, I might be more inclined to try and enjoy it. It's easier to dismiss or forgive the negatives when you're a fan, but I'm not. I couldn't give a damn about some German cartoon from over 25 years ago. So this begs the second question. What the hell was going on at Craft Gold in 1993 to release a paint by numbers platformer? Well, Sega. Sega is the answer. As the publisher for this microwave cookbook of a game, they imposed a three month development deadline on poor Craft Gold. Why though? I'm not completely sure. What I do know is that the Otterfence TV show was being shopped around various TV networks out of Germany at the time as a potential competitor to The Simpsons. It didn't fare well, but I have a suspicion that Sega hurriedly commissioned Craft Gold ahead of time, anticipating that it would. I have no idea if the show made it to Australia or not back then, but the game does seem quite common over here. If you were in the know about that sort of thing during the 90s in Australia, please chime in. I was more of a baby than Bruno at the time, so I have no idea. My American friends, fret not. This game never made it to the world of NTSC, so it shall never be imposed on you. For the rest of my pal brethren, Pitofence was released on Game Gear and Master System if this interests you and you don't own a Mega Drive. But that's all I have to say. Feels good to bust out a negative review occasionally. I feel much better. Goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.